Joining us now in Washington, D.C., Nancy Sherman, the author of The Untold War. She's also a professor of philosophy at Georgetown University. Nancy, good to have you on the program. How are you tonight? Fine. Thanks so much, Steve. I want to get into this with you because you've interviewed numerous American veterans of current and past wars to, as you say it, get inside the hearts and minds and souls of soldiers to tell an untold story. So let's start with that. What is the untold story that you're now bringing to light? The story is the story of the emotions that soldiers feel in war. Uh, they go to war, they rev up for war, they stay in war sometimes seven, eight, nine years now, and they come home. And uh, there's a moral story of their emotions, and it's not just a story captured entirely by understanding psychological phenomena of post-traumatic stress disorder, though that's part of it. So part of what they do is they rev up for war. And as you said in your intro, many go to war with some sense of payback, not all. And sometimes there's anger, and um, it's a combat motivator, and it's an important aspect of the soldier's psyche, and it has to be tamed and restrained. Um, that's amongst the emotions. Other emotions are solidarity for each other and how to play that off against uh, rules of engagement that require that they um, persuade civilians to join up with their cause and that often means not fighting as hard as they might to protect their buddies. Sometimes they do have to leave a fallen comrade behind and that hurts a lot and that triggers feelings of anger as well. Let me jump feelings in here with betrayal. Let me jump in here with a follow-up on that on that phrase you use combat motivator because what's interesting is from reading this segment in your book this is not new. Uh, your book is filled with references to philosophers and their views on wars that go back 2,000 years. So why is it that these sort of base instincts are still the same today as they were a couple of millennia ago? Well, it's a good question. Uh, I think you're right. There's uh, a sense that, uh, of, the, of the strength of these feelings that you feel if you read Homer in the Iliad. Achilles uh, is a man filled with wrath and fury. Uh, and Homer says at some point that, uh, you know, he lacks a kind of decency at the very end when he drags his, uh, the, the, the person who killed his buddy Patroclus around, he drags Hector around the back of a chariot seven times. As to why the feelings don't go away, um, they're partly about, uh, you know, anger I think is a healthy feeling. It just comes in all sorts of flavors. Um, the Stoics say you should just eradicate it. It's so, it's, anger is so messy and so uh, limitless and boundless. It's like a runner you can't stop once you start. The pace outstrips reason. So get rid of it entirely, even and especially in combat. And others, you know, I think Aristotle would say, hey, it's a part of courage. You can tame it. You can restrain it. And there are parts of it that you wouldn't want to get rid of. Like I interviewed... Uh, the man who helped stop the massacre at My Lai in the Vietnam era, Hugh Thompson. Thirty years later, he still had a sense of what I call righteous indignation or, mor or you know, moral outrage. If he didn't have that sense, he wouldn't have been so motivated to intercede in what he found was a horrible, horrible uh, event. He saw his fellow GIs killing, massacring other individuals. So it comes in different flavors. You can't get rid of it wholesale. But there are cousins on this spectrum. Some are uh, feelings of revenge can be very primal, like vendettas, and and outstrip uh, uh, judicial restraint. You might say or out, outstrip proportionality. And others like indignation, uh, uh, a sense of moral outrage, a sense of outcry. I think are really healthy signs of humanity that were we to eliminate them, we'd eliminate part of our humanity. In which case, and I wonder whether or not the soldier's desire for payback or revenge is absolutely fundamental to their belief that what they are doing is justified. Well, I think some would say a commander would, who has to reign in his troops, a good commander would say, hey, let's look for a sense of justice, but not necessarily a sense of of punishment that will be closer to exacting a blood feud or exacting a vendetta um, in the way that traditional tribal revenge might be.
But, you know, I interviewed someone at Walter Reed Hospital, our local hospital here in Washington, but also the flagship hospital for um, the Army. And he had been a sniper in Afghanistan in the early years. And Is this Rob Kislow? I just want to make sure I got the yeah, right story it, here. Rob Kislow. Yeah, okay. that's right. Rob Kislow. As he was describing what it felt like to be the last man in a formation having his buddies attacked and, uh, you know, trying to get back at the guy who was getting him and who had just killed his buddy, you know, he, he opened his... his uh, his arms on, on burst and, and started automatically shooting a, 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 a magazine of 30 rounds. And he said it was the, you know, the best freaking feeling. And, and for him, it was a survival instinct. I don't know if he could have performed as well as he did if he wasn't motivated that way. Well, he let's fill in angry. some of the spaces here, Nancy. Hang on, because he didn't say frickin'. He said way more than frickin'. Uh, he, he dropped You're the right. F-bomb numerous times in that, which indicated, a, a, you know, even all this time later, a level of passion and anger about recounting the event that was really quite something. But this is a guy who lost, he lost half a leg. He, I mean, he was shot in numerous places. He watched, num you know, numbers of his buddies gunned down. And revenge was a huge motivator for him. And he had a titanium arm. And he's got a titanium yep. arm, yeah. So what, what did you, after, he after hearing his experience and all this time later, the passion with which he was telling it to you, um, what was so telling about that experience for you? For me, it was that, uh, A, it was still live for him. This is two years later. Um, secondly, it was his sense of survival to perform well hung on, us, hung on that ability to really be angry. There, it, you know, he was a good sniper, and, and, and he saw his buddies down, and, and he was, their unit was overrun by a, a swarm of uh, insurgents coming out of, like a beehive, he said. Uh, and it wasn't that he relished the feeling beforehand. It wasn't kind of anticipatory revenge. It was that once he was able to defend himself and kind of, and get the sniper who had just killed his buddy, he had a sense of satisfaction. Oh, I think it was yeah, beyond satisfaction, though, wasn't it? It was pleasure. It was beyond satisfaction. It was pleasure, was it not? I use that word mildly. Yeah, it was a, a satisfaction. Aristotle talks about it. He says Aristotle, excuse me, Aristotle says anger is a desire to take revenge for an injury or an assault on oneself. And there's both pain in feeling that injury or assault and there is pleasure in the taking of the revenge. Should we be and, uh, uncomfortable or embarrassed at the notion of taking pleasure in achieving payback? I think what's, what we should be anxious about and what should make us morally queasy, if, if you like, is having a unit be motivated entirely by that. And when I speak to commanders and I've, I've taught uh, at the Naval Academy for two, three years with individuals who lead units. And I talk to my uh, students at Reserve Officer Training Corps at Georgetown who will lead units. They don't want to rev up their troops to the point of which they're filled with revenge. They want them to be able to uh, restrain their actions when they have to, to not have hatred in their hearts, to do the job well, but not in a way that is that, that exacts disproportionate violence. And that does require uh, a certain amount of framing of, of the emotions. Others will say, though, and this is, I'm now talking about Army majors who've, who, who've commanded units, that there's nothing like the pleasure of getting the guy, the, sn the sniper, who was who was who was getting your troops? No, sure, I understand so that. But it's, soldiers, it's mixed, for the most but it part, has to be restrained. Yeah, soldiers, for the most part, at least the ones I've spoken to, certainly feel that what they're doing is honorable, and providing they're following all the you know the rules of engagement and so on. They they feel that that what they're doing is is filled with honor. Uh, but there is a you know as you've told us here on the same continuum, honor can lead to strong passion, desire for revenge. How do you know when you're crossing a line from one to the other? Often you don't, and honor is itself a slippery word. There's a kind of, there's often misplaced honor. You know, there, we, we know about honor, uh, 
honor revenge and horrible incidents of honor, like Haditha sometimes, and trying to get back in ways that uh, involve killing of civilians. You know you, you've stepped over a, a boundary when you are killing blatantly uh, innocent civilians, when they're men, women, children who are not armed and who do, and you're not mistaking their role in, in, uh, in war. Uh, but you're aiming your target at that. That's not a legitimate target, and that's that certainly something uh, commanders and individual combatants need to be very, very wary of. So, uh, you know, we're also, you don't want to demonize the enemy. You don't want to allow effective combat motivation to include demonization of the enemy. So there are all sorts of warning signals, I think, that are critical here. But I would not take that whole emotion anger and pluck it out as some, uh, some might, like do, might like to do because I think it has some morally important aspects there. It helps us to record violations. It helps us to record um, um, uh, trespasses, but it also can, can rev up a host of other kinds of uh, uh, illegitimate behaviors sure. that you want to Let me ask you, you one more follow-up based on that then, and then we'll get our uh other friends here uh, involved in the discussion as well. As you've looked back through history at warfare, have any wars been won in your view uh, without the citizens feeling a need for payback, retribution, revenge, call it what you will? That's an interesting question. Uh, well, you say citizens. Um, you know, I think, I think certainly there is a sense, there can be a sense of justice that doesn't quite get on the on the, uh, uh, doesn't have raw revenge in it. Um, but I think that, uh, uh, you know, there, there can also be humanitarian interventions where I think the predominant feeling amongst the soldiers I talk to is that they want to help. That, you know, there are the bad guys and the good guys, but they are very, very motivated to rescue, to intervene, to save. And that is a feeling that, 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 that shadows the other feelings that they may have toward those that are the offenders um, and the aggressors. Okay. So, uh, you know, I think often there is that, that sense of, of doing good work and doing good work on the part of those that have been um, oppressed against. Nancy, we thank you for setting the table for the discussion. That's Nancy Sherman from our studios in Washington, D.C., the author of The Untold War.